I am joined by Rianne Anthony, all the way Hi. over up there, and Adrian Clutter. Thank you guys so much for being here. We're happy to have you. Uh, Rianne is from the city of Charlottesville, which is located in central Virginia. And Adrian joins us from Montgomery County, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. So we're very lucky to have them each here today, and we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So let's start with you, Adrian. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your Park and Recreation Agency? Okay, uh, my name is Adrian, and I'm from Montgomery County, Maryland. Our, um, our department serves uh, just over a million residents. We are a very diverse county, majority uh, minority county, Montgomery County. We have about a little over 200,000 young people in our county. Uh, our county uh, is very suburban, but with urban issues. And we're growing right outside of the District of Columbia. And uh, we have just over 40% uh, of our schools now on free and reduced meals. Uh, so we're dealing with some tough issues in Montgomery County. Uh, I come from Prince George's County, formerly from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, which has a similar demographic, majority minority also community, serving a million residents bordering um, the other side of the District Columbia in Prince George's County, Maryland. Great, excellent. And Rianne, would you like yeah. to tell us some about yourself? Yep, I'm Rianne Anthony, work for the city of Charlottesville. We're totally on the opposite spectrum. Uh, we are a nice community, small mountain town community. Uh, our population is roughly around about 48,000 people. That's a lot of people. Um, again, um, or our whole school district uh, falls under the free and reduced lunch. Um, so we have similar uh, challenges uh, like my dear friend next door. Um, we, we serve roughly around about 11 sites. We are split in between uh, seven during the summer, summer camp, that's a closed site, and then we have four drop-in programs. So that's a little bit about our community. Great, thank you guys. So um, we're gonna start off and talk in detail about the meal programs and, and your agency's experience with those. So Adrian, I would love it if you can talk a little more specifically about the meal programs that you guys operate, um, whether you are the sponsor of those programs and if you offer both summer food service program and the child and adult care food program. Okay, we're offering both programs. Uh, we, we have about 33 sites in the summertime that we're offering meals. We have an amazing sponsor. I have to give a tremendous amount of credit to Montgomery County uh, Public Schools Food and Nutrition Services. They're our sponsor. They make it easy for us. Um, we've helped uh, other recreation departments uh, local city departments in within Montgomery County also jump on board um, because how easy they make it for us. After school we're at about 26 locations uh, uh, during the school year where we're serving meals. In the summertime we also uh, offer the drop-in program where young people 18 and under can come and eat and this uh, last year we launched a mobile site. Uh, this year we've got a van going out to um, uh, communities that are geographically locked in and have a hard time getting out of their neighborhood and we've got the van going out delivering meals and we're combining that with physical activity so we've been tremendously successful in Montgomery County. Great, excellent. And Rian, can you share a little bit more specifics about your meal programs? Yep, again, uh, we do exactly the same. We do our summer meals program and then also our uh, uh, after-school meal program. During the summer, as I mentioned earlier, we have roughly around about uh, seven sites and we provide breakfast and lunch. And then our after-school program, uh, which starts in September, uh, we have four communities uh, and we are based in uh, housing communities um, so we serve uh, roughly last year uh, we served roughly around about uh, 31,000 meals um, again we are a bit smaller um, but uh, I believe that uh, with the more years we get invested with a program working with different partnerships uh, it will be much much better and smoother and we are the sponsor so we uh, sponsor uh, smaller daycare for instance um, uh, uh, kids uh, for computers uh, we provide meals for them during the summer too excellent great 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your experience working with NRPA in the past on this initiative. So uh, for those of us tuning in, we have had a grant opportunity in the past, and so many people watching are actually current grantees or past grantees of our Out of School Time Programs grant, but we also have some new faces. But I am curious to know if you guys have any um, input on you know, talking about the value of these federal nutrition programs within your community. How have they helped uh, to, to shape the health and wellness of youth within your community? Well, first of all, I think that they've given us a little bit of leverage to be able to do more. Um, I, I think that it, it's understanding that recreation agencies, knowing that they are the leading, um, generally the leading out of school time food service provider and the out of school time provider for young people, that we're an important uh, we're an important organization to have at the table and not to be uh, discounted or left out. And that's been huge for us, to, to let our community and our community members know that one of the things that we're doing, we're not just serving meals. And it's kind of how we articulate that, but we're addressing food insecurity. Uh, we're providing outreach to communities um, that are you know, have limited access to fresh, fresh vegetables or are considered food deserts. Um, and so people are seeing us as a critical element now. And, it's, and, and getting on board with NRPA has been huge because it gives us that credentialing and, and um, our partnership with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. It gives us that the support me support mechanism to, you know, say that, hey, we're doing great things. Um, that alignment allows us to move forward more strategically and really articulate the benefits to our community. Yeah, you make some great points. That's, that's so true. And it's really important for everyone to understand that you're not simply serving meals. You're helping to solve some of these bigger issues. Hunger and malnutrition are, are so important to be addressing in each of our communities. Rian, do you have some things to add? Yeah, again, you know, uh, it's nice to partner with NRPA, um, especially um, as a local uh, government entity. Uh, our council members are on board with how uh, health and wellness um, so uh, they are greatly appreciative of this grant and and especially with this grant helps us out with a lot of staffing uh, because we have to meet ratios um, so it's nice to get uh, uh, meals to the communities but we do not want to limit kids for not attending so this helps us out to expand to get us more staff to actually meet the needs of the community that's about it. Great. Um, so let's talk about some of the strategies that you guys have used in the past to mm -hmm. grow these meal programs. Mm -hmm. um, are there any you know, specific strategies that you've used to help increase the number of meals and the number of children that you're serving within your community? I think that the, um, the grant really helped us um, get organized and and something simple that we did was we we set out a goal for ourselves to say that hey a hundred percent of the programs that we have that qualify for the food and nutrition program need to participate and we weren't doing that uh, we realigned ourselves we assigned a point person to be the liaison between the sponsor and our site so each site wasn't out there on their own doing it on their own and and sometimes it was just a simple disconnect they didn't know they qualified or um, they they weren't sure or what to do or who to reach out to. And by making those slight adjustments and saying that we were going to meet that 100% goal, um, we did it. And, and this mm -hmm. was the summer that we did it. Great. That's great. And Rian, any strategies that you guys have used to increase the number of meals and the children that you've served? Yeah, so number one again, it's basically organization, um, organizational skills. Uh, what we did implement, uh, I work very closely with our programming department um, to get that organizational strategy. Um, sometimes I feel that it's kind of slightly disconnected if you don't have a great communication skills with the program uh, um, department and then also uh, the school department we go through the schools department we contract with them to do our meals um, so number one I, I would say really really try to get your your nutrition uh, department um, uh, be very close with them um, uh, try to be open uh, with communication and then also uh, communicate very closely with those programs especially during our camps in, in Charlottesville our camps is huge um, uh, trying to work with that also what we did provide is also to increase our numbers is provide more staff because again uh, ratios are so important to us uh, so we want to make sure that we are opening up our doors 
to allow more kids to participate. Uh, just a small insight in our summer programs, uh, it is a closed site, so it's a registration, um, uh, so, so you have to register. Uh, what our department also work at and really good at is our sponsorship uh, and our scholarship program. Um, we sponsor kids and also we have scholarship programs, so we can sponsor kids uh, up to 90%. That means our camp for one week costs roughly around about four to five dollars for that kid just to come in and participate in the program. So staffing is great and again I can't stress it enough organization trying to get everybody uh, in their roles and focus on those roles. Absolutely yep couldn't agree more. Um, I'm gonna pause right here because I am seeing some questions come in uh, and I also want to just let people know if you're having some technical difficulties right now um, and your stream hasn't started, if you refresh your screen, then that may help to resolve that. Um, in addition, you can contact our customer service department and they can put you in touch with some technical support for today's webcasting. So um, let's take w one question right now from Paula Considine. Hi, Paula, thanks for joining us today. Hi. And uh, she is curious to know if during the school year you guys provide dinners, snacks, or both. So Adrian, uh, during the school year, we just provide, or we do provide the supper, um, and we also provide the snacks. So we are providing the dinner. Um, I still got summer on my mind, uh -huh. so I'm, <laughs> I'm having trouble making that uh, that shift. But we are providing both. Great. Um, for us, our after-school program, we only provide uh, supper. And we're kind of in a unique situation because uh, where we have our after-school program, it's at a housing um, uh, center. Uh, so basically, they have staff that runs the facility. We just come in as guests and program for them. So we start at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but the housing site is open all day. So we partner with them so if you go to that Pacific housing site, they provide a snack, but we provide the dinner. So overall, if you work really closely with your housing community, um, those kids actually get a snack and a dinner. But again, on the city side of things, we provide the dinner at those housing sites. That's interesting, and I think um, that is a good point, Rian. And it's important to note too that many of our agencies look different in each community uh, and have different partners who are essential to this work, as well as different facilities. So some of you have rec centers, some of you have parks, some of you partner with local housing uh, authority projects to be able to offer these programs, but you're coming to the people where they are and meeting their needs in that capacity. So I think that's a really important point, and you should always be thinking about different community partners. If some of you are not currently operating a meals program, but there are others in your community, perhaps you can come in from the, a nutrition education standpoint or a physical activity standpoint, or work together with them to bring more of these programs to your community. So I think that's a really great point. I'm glad you brought that up. So um, we're gonna go ahead and head back to some of our assigned questions, but we'll get to everything throughout the presentation. Um, and I wanna kinda transition and talk about the nutritional quality of food, um, since that's obviously a very large focus for this Commit to Health work. Um, so if you guys can talk about the importance of the quality of food within your program, so not just that meal provision, but also the nutrition aspect and how you work with your sponsor and your vendor to make sure that these, nutri these meals are quality and have a high uh, nutrition content. So I think for us it's, it's kind of funny because we're trying to get out of the old stereotype of the dreaded school lunch. And our sponsor, I mean, they are so committed. Um, they ensure that the food, uh, foods are whole grain, that they're 100% fruit juice is being served, that uh, the milk is either 1% or fat free, and that a fresh fruit or vegetable served with every meal. Now the other thing that they're doing that I think throws people off a little bit is they're making sure that the food's kid friendly, that the kids will actually eat the food so they're not being wasted. And I think sometimes that's where we get a little bit of a controversy um, they might a uh, parent or an adult might come in and they might see like a chicken nugget but they're not realizing that it's a a, a quality piece of meat and that um, and that the breading on it is whole grain and, uh, and so we're really trying to break that old stereotype yeah. our sponsors working so hard to um, to change that environment in, in the perception of the school lunch mm -hmm. great so at Charlottesville again we go through, I would encourage folks, if you have a school district close to you, they have the licensed kitchen. It is just so nice. It takes everything off 
our chest. So we have a contract with our local uh, um, school district and they provide the lunches. And the school district follows similar um, criteria. Oh, that fly, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, but they provide the exact same um, criteria that we are required to provide the kid um, with as uh, uh, she mentioned uh, about whole grain, the chicken nuggets, yep, might look different, but it's all healthy products. Again, uh, we try to work very closely with our uh, nutrition department at the school is to make sure that if it's 100% juice, uh, vegetable juice, that uh, we also don't have juice, juice, juice all week. We provide some fresh options in terms of apples, bananas, and stuff of that nature. So that's what we try to do, is try to work really closely with them. And then just to add on with the menu, uh, that's very, very important. Kids are very, very picky. Um, so, so what we just tried out uh, uh, last year, we added two different weeks of menus. And we had a survey with the kids um, to find out. And what we found out is that the two-week cycle works okay, but if it's chicken nuggets on Monday, they're not coming on Monday. So we're also having that battle, how can we attract kids to come to the program and then also eat? And we found out that it all depends what's on the menu and they will come. So we're trying to work with a uh, um, few a focus group of kids right now to see what we can do differently. That's great, and actually we have a question from Colleen, I'm guessing in Chicago, who was actually wondering about that, so I'm glad that you just brought that up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, creating that menu is really important, and it's great to have that input from the people who are actually eating it. Have you guys done anything, any type of focus group, or actually sitting down with the kids to talk about what they like, what they don't like? Well, we don't, we don't really get a lot of input on the menu um, that's coming out of the school system. Now, they have done some of that work on their own, uh, but for us, we definitely give them feedback. Mm -hmm. If it's something that we're find, uh, finding the kids won't eat or it all ends up on the share table, um, we're getting back to them and saying, hey, can you try something different? And I do know that they're doing a, they have test kitchens. They're doing a lot of work uh, on their own during, throughout the school year to try to get it, you know, get it to where the, the kids will eat it. Yep. I just have great. one more comment. Yeah. Uh, for our after school year right now, we just um, kind of getting our contract together with the schools and we decided to go with a four week menu so that kids will not know every Monday. So every fifth Monday, that same item will land on that menu. Uh, and the hardest thing is we have four sites, it's kind of small, but you know, at one site, uh, this group might not like pizza, but the other group likes pizza. So we're trying to, I don't have the perfect solution, but we're trying to see how we can solve that issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, that's great. And so offering, you know, a variety of foods yeah. too that you think helps, you know, mm -hmm. keep the kids engaged with these programs and keeps them coming back. They're enjoying them yeah. more. Um, all right, we're going to go ahead and, and head back over here. Um, so I, we'd like to talk about marketing a little bit and how you guys have marketed, um, you know, not only these meal programs, but how you've marketed them together with your after school programs. Um, you know, we hear about the stigma of, again, that school lunch and, and the summer meals program quite a bit. So what have you guys done from the marketing standpoint um, to help recruit kids and to, to help um, get that message out there that these programs offer snacks and, and suppers and things like that? But from a marketing standpoint, I think you know it's important to families. I mean, we have a lot of struggling families in our community, and if they have multiple children, I think one of the things is families realize the economic value. If a uh, if a participant's taking uh, part in the meal program, uh, we've determined that if if they take advantage of it, full advantage of it, I mean it could mean at a minimum six hundred dollars. Um, per year, which I think if you if you compare that to really a family going out to the store, it's really closer to a thousand dollars per year per kid per family. So we're not having to do a whole lot of convincing. It's just letting the community know that it's there, mm -hmm. and it's making sure that we're reaching 
out to our school principals, that we're reaching out to our partners, that they're putting it out on their uh, connect ed messages uh, through their social media, and, and folks are coming to us. We have some fantastic principals who will take the flyers and go door to door because they want to make sure that the kids that go to their school and that live in their communities are fed during the summer. Um, and so we, we just have a lot of uh, tremendous support around that. Our programs are busting at the seams, and we have wait lists all across the county, and we can't have enough of them. Um, and, and so the, the marketing's been fairly easy for us, mm -hmm. but again, social media, um, getting the word out through our partners has been, been pretty key. Great. Yep, for us, um, you know, we do the normal uh, marketing, uh, open houses, uh, PSA, press releases. Uh, just before this summer, uh, we worked very closely with our local uh, NBC 29, and they actually invited us for an afternoon um, uh, segment to talk about the summer camp and focusing about the meals, and I think that that worked out really, really well um, to go live. It was a five-minute uh, um, spiel. Um, that I gave about free food. If you need scholarships, uh, come to the Park and Rec office. So that worked out really good. And again, we are not there yet in terms of uh, a great uh, partnership with our principals, but that's one of our things that we are striving for next year is working very closely with our school district and also working with the community. Uh, um, people know that we have the meals programs, but it's hard to connect with our community uh, because in our community uh, mom is working two three jobs it's very hard to actually talk to mom or dad especially at our open houses and the after school program because these kids come straight from school all on their own and come to our program so so we're trying to bridge that gap is how can we get more community engagement especially in charlottesville and we're working on a few strategies for this after school yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and so you both kind of have talked about this a little bit too um, and named some of those partners in your community. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the school system and what a valuable mm -hmm. partner they have been and, mm -hmm. and how they've kind of made your work even easier. Um, but what are, who are some other partners that you guys have worked with either on the local level, level or also on the state and national level? Um, specific people that come to mind? Yeah, some uh, internally within our own government system. I think our Health and Human Services Department's been key. Um, one of the, they have some great programs as well, and they're making referrals to us. They're making sure that you know kids who um, are re receiving wraparound services in other places are getting to us in the summer and during the after school time, and, and we're able to work together. Um, we even work with our local police department. We're fortunate we have a uh, positive youth development initiative um, that was put in place by our county executive which brings together local police, health and human services, um, state's attorney's office, and recreation brings us all to the table. And so we're having these conversations, it's, and, it, and that's been really instrumental. Alliance for a Healthier Generation has been a fantastic partner. Um, they've really offered not only the support, but the credibility to say, hey, you guys are doing right things, as well as NRPA. Um, other local partners include Share Our Strength, No mm -hmm. Kid Hungry Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, they've provided additional financial support, which has helped beyond um, the NRPA grant, uh, increased staffing. Um, I know that um, providing resources to get our mobile uh, recreation, our mobile food programs out to various communities. They've been a fantastic partner. Um, and then our, our um, local health organizations such as Adventist Health Communities, um, Man of Foods. So everybody's contributing and, and it's once it happens, it's like a snowball effect. It's, it's so cool because then everybody wants to get on board and your resource list starts to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, as, as I'll pick back on her, uh, you know, NRPA, uh, great sponsor, um, Alliance, great. Um, uh, uh, our local sponsors, we, we have great partners called Peanut Butter uh, Amanjali Foundation. Um, uh, they will come out to our, our, our special events and they uh, talk about uh, healthy foods. They talk about uh, healthy growing, um, so how to start a garden, and, and that's just a great partnership that we have. Also, we work with uh, Martha Jefferson um, uh, Hospital. 
during our summer programs. We work with, uh, we, we, it's called a city schoolyard garden, basically in one of our camps. Um, they actually uh, have a, a community garden um, that they grow about vegetables and that's also kind of tied in to our curriculum. Um, so we believe that if, if we start at a young age um, talking to kids about healthy eating, healthy habits, I think that will, um, uh, you know, that will follow them throughout their, their um, uh, uh, growing up um, in growing up. And I think that's uh, that, that's our partnership. You know, we have another great partnership with our programming department, our park and rec department. One of our um, strategic goals are um, health and wellness. Um, so we're trying to really strive to, through, to that. Great. Excellent. So um, we're going to take a few mm -hmm. more questions here, and then we will transition to talking about the healthy eating physical activity standards mm -hmm. and your experience with that. Mm -hmm. But we do have some questions coming in. Um, Sandy, hi Sandy, would like to know how the dinners are funded. So I think you said you have a supper um, program. Can you talk a little bit about that? Your school system is probably still your sponsor. They're our sponsor, mm -hmm. so it's the federally funded um, piece of it. And, and one of the important things about that is educating staff that, that's what taking the attendance and doing the administrative work is important for them because they're getting a reimbursement. Um, they're providing that meal and then the school system's getting a reimbursement for that meal. Yeah, so that supper program also falls under the federal nutrition programs. Um, again, you know, each community and what they're able to offer is different. So some people do a snack in the after school program and some also do supper. Um, and it really, you know, depends on what works for your community, but it's certainly something to explore if you guys are interested in that. Um, we also have a question on uh, school kitchen staff. So if you guys have hired school kitchen staff to prepare the meals during summer. Um, so again, it, using the school system as your partner, that's pretty much something that they take care of for you guys, correct? Since Yeah, so, so basically we contract with the schools. Um, uh, they have the nutrition staff. Uh, they, they are trained um, uh, to handle food uh, the proper way, and uh, that's all taken care of of the school district and then uh, we just work with uh, with our local contract and our contract is uh, and as I said our nutrition department is very good um, um, we sit around a table we look at the reimbursement uh, cost and we go off to re with the reimbursement so that 99% uh, we are always um, uh, very rarely breaking even uh, in order for me to pay back uh, the contract, but we're very close to uh, meeting those needs. They, they know th the importance of the meal, so they will never uh, um, um, charge us above our reimbursement, reimbursement rate. Um, so that's a great uh, system um, to work with the schools. And we have a bit of a combination. Uh, so when we're, we have some of our programs are in schools and some are in community centers. Mm -hmm. When we're in schools, we have a, a threshold. If we get to that, um, that 60 students or more enrollment, we, get, we actually get hot meals, which is a bonus. Uh, if we have fewer than 60 enrolled, it's traditionally a, a cold meal served. And there's generally a kitchen support staff in there. Sometimes, uh, sometimes there is not. And we do send all of our staff through training as a backup for summer and during the school year. And so on site, it's our staff who are delivering the, the cold meals on our community center or recreation uh, properties or the park properties, mm -hmm. um, but at the schools we take advantage of that kitchen when we can. That's great, yeah. Um, and I think that that question kind of leads us into the next one too. Uh, Manuel from San Diego, I think, hi Manuel, um, is curious to know how many agencies are using sponsors or how many are actually the sponsors. Um, so in Parks and Rec we have a, a different, a, a variety. Some agencies are the sponsors of these meal programs. Others rely on their school system or another community organization to be the sponsor uh, and, and serve the meals at their sites. So it, it looks different in every community. Um, as far as kind of a percentage, I think we're, we're almost at about 50-50 or so of, of park and recreation agencies who are the sponsors um, and, and agencies 
agencies who are using another community sponsor. Um, and as you can hear, Rianne and Adrian have both talked about their experiences. Um, you know, for, for a new agency who might be looking to start one of these programs, we certainly suggest meeting with people in your community who are already operating these programs and determining if it's a good fit for you to become a sponsor of these programs or for you to perhaps work with other um, community-based agencies who are already implementing them. Because that either way, it helps to feed kids within your community and ensure that they're getting these meals and these healthy snacks. Um, so I want to talk about one last thing because I've got a couple mm -hmm. questions coming in about that. And that topic is food waste. So um, for those of us who are working on the out of school time programs grants, that is an aspect um, of that grant. But it's also an important thing that we really want to stress um, in all of our agencies. So. Um, with these federal nutrition programs, the topic of food waste comes up quite a bit. Um, and I'm curious to know if you guys have any strategies that help to address that, whether you're using a share table um, or have a food donation process within your agencies. So a lot of it's in the administration of it. We do have a share table and we encourage kids to put it on the share table. But it's how we order the food day to day. So each day we're calling in uh, to our sponsor to put in an order. Uh, if we had a low attendance on a particular day, that food could go back into the, into the, the refrigerator, the storage unit, and be saved for the next day. So we would order fewer meals uh, for the next day to try to minimize as much uh, food waste as we can. And it, it generally works out pretty good. We don't have a whole lot left over. Um, and, and some of our drop-in sites, uh, one of the hardest things we deal with is trying to stop adults from taking the stuff off the share table. I mean, kids are, kids are eating it, so we, we're, we're not really struggling with food waste as much you, as you would think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in the beginning, um, uh, probably around about uh, two years ago, uh, we had an increase in, in food waste. Um, how we try to challenge that is, again, the traditional way of share tables and stuff like that. That's great. But what we have uh, found out that uh, uh, with we order meals every day. And with our staff, uh, our goal is trying to get more uh, accurate on the daily attendance and and uh, I mean how many meals we actually serve uh, we gain back uh, on statistics is to look okay on Tuesdays you, you know Tuesdays what's happening in the community oh there's a boys and girls club or is basketball uh, uh, league starting up and we can measure how many kids will be attending um, the nicest thing with our partner um, in our contract we state uh, by one o'clock we'll have to put in the order mm. um, and that is nice daily we communicate with the kitchen staff is to say today it's going to be um, uh, 20 um, next week might be 50 uh, and they work with us for our summer program um, works out really really well uh, because what we have uh, done is it's a closed site so we inform parents when they come to a sign up table uh, is to inform them uh, try to drop your kid off by 945 because by 945 we will have to give numbers to the kitchen for this for lunches so we are getting real good with that strategy um, uh, so try to find your own uh, little strategies within your community uh, and your department to see how efficient you can become with that that's great. Yeah. Um, so I think those are some kind of uh, some of the common yeah. tactics that are used in addressing food waste. Yeah. Um, so ordering numbers, making sure that you have a system in place for ordering your meals. Um, it works out best if you can do it that day or perhaps the day before. Mm -hmm. Again, sometimes that comes down to your sponsor and your relationship yeah. with them. Um, having that share table and having a food donation system um, process. But you'll notice that um, every state has different regulations on these programs. And that's actually why NRPA is coming out with a food waste best practices guide that will be released later this year. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And it's gonna address a lot of those things on the pre side, on the ordering number side, on the quality of food uh, and working with your sponsor and your food vendor to ensure that the meals are, are items that the kids will actually enjoy. Uh, and then also on that post side. So what do you do with the food if you have it if you have leftover food, you know, aside from a share table and food donation, what are some other strategies, perhaps composting and things like that. 
So be on the lookout for that. Um, and we are going to go ahead and go ahead and transition into um, talking about the healthy eating physical activity standards just because I want to get through some questions on some other aspects as well. So um, let's talk a little bit about your experience with implementing those HEPA standards uh, specifically in your before and after school program. So we're heading into the fall. Some of us are already in the fall um, and into the school year program. So if we can talk about um, some of those nutrition and physical activity standards, that would be great. So I think the key for us was to, to pick a few of them. Mm -hmm. And we weren't going to tackle the whole list at once. So we picked a few that we thought were really doable. And we, and, and we picked some that we were already doing so we could talk about those wins as well. So we got early wins. I think the key for us was really educating our staff and our colleagues that this was not going to be another program. Mm -hmm. Staff were so worried that this was going to be another program that came and six months from now we weren't going to be doing it anymore. And why should they invest their time and oh here we go again. And they would say stuff like oh remember when we did such and such and we're not doing that anymore. So really helping them understand and educate them that it was something that was going to be sustainable. That it wasn't another program but it was just a new way to do business. That was key for us. And then when we started picking a few of these things and we started working on some of our goals um, and even some fun ones. I always tell my staff about um, modeling the healthy eating. Uh, and I always talk about okay if you're going to bring in your own food and we encourage staff to sit and eat with the kids and, and, and establish that camaraderie but I always tell them if I can't convince you to bring in something healthy then you're gonna have to eat in the closet by yourself and we make jokes about it but and we really work on it we talk about it all the time so picking a few of uh, the healthy eating and physical activity standards and um, and just repeating those over and over and over again and educating staff it starts to catch on mm -hmm. and we've been able to do that we've transformed some of our programs and and it really adds an element of high quality. We used to serve a lot of food. Chipotle, all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. And we always thought that that was the hook to get particularly teens in the door. I, I have a, in my shop I have a lot of uh, uh, teenagers and we would serve pizza and now it's become a running joke kind of in our agency because they say I'm the, the anti um, pizza person. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we've made this shift now at our uh, athletic events like our futsal program we have the fruit of the fruit of the week um, and I always said to the staff if the kids are hungry they will eat it and the kids are enjoying the fruit they're finding that they're enjoying the snack bars we only serve water at all of our programs primarily um, and so it's really been easy to move away from the sugary juices and um, serve non caffeinated uh, beverages uh, and the transformation has been great and we've saved a tremendous amount of money money that we've been able to use in other areas and to really enhance the quality of our programs mm -hmm. so w when when people started figuring this out they got on board really quickly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I was again exactly the same it's educating the staff it all starts with the adult um, so when we looked at at how can we change it's exactly the same thing we can't force the staff um, to uh, order healthy items but we did tell staff you know at least don't let the kids at camp see you eating that fried chicken or eating that pizza that you order because we're trying to model uh, the behavior and especially with our camps there's a lot of young kids they look up to these counselors um, like their parents um, so we try to work on that also what we also try to implement slowly but surely in our camp because this is our, going to be our first year that we're going to choose a few for our after school program we wanted to see how well it works in our camps where we have um, uh, the tradition um, of uh, fitness. You, you remember when you were high school, you had to go to the gym and work out. So what we're trying to do is in our transition periods, uh, we do activities. So for instance, if we just get done with our supper, okay guys, we're going to do arts and crop, but before we go arts and crop, everybody up, um, uh, choose a number one to ten and do some physical activity match up with your prime numbers and kids will run to the prime numbers um, and we try to keep them moving constantly instead of saying okay run to the first line and back tradition we're trying to change those those fitness tradition because kids don't realize if they're doing a fun activity that is physical activity and then also utilizing your space uh, doesn't have to be inside your community center you know, go for a nature walk, 
go outside, use the basketball court, use the grass, you know, have a picnic outside. So we are doing those um, small changes. And uh, uh, in the summer, it's working out real great. Um, um, our bad poison in, in summer is our movie times. And we're trying to cut out our movie times um, out of our summer program because, excuse me, because it's an hour and a half, kids sitting and watching a screen. And kids nowadays have no problem of sitting and looking at a screen for eight, nine hours a day. So uh, this year we kind of cut back on that. Hopefully by next year we will not be providing any form of movies at our camps. So that's great. I think you guys make some really good points about that too. Um, especially that, you know, this is something that happens over time. And it might not be something where you can come in and tomorrow say, okay, we're cutting all screen time from our programs. You know, in Charlottesville, they needed to take some incremental steps to get there. But eventually, over the course of these um, different strategies being implemented, they will get there. Um, and I think it's also important to note, you guys talked about utilizing the different facilities that you have in your community. Um, whether you have outdoor space or if you're an indoor facility, um, getting creative creative with physical activity breaks, thinking about ways that you can incorporate some of these things into programming that already exists. Um, and then again, you know, I heard from you guys that it's easier than you thought it would be. Um, so we hear that all the time. This summer, uh, you know, we certainly heard that it was pretty simple to incorporate a fruit or vegetable. It was pretty simple to make sure that kids uh, are getting water at camp. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty simple to make sure that they're running around and being active. Um, ensuring the quality of those things is another aspect of it, but again, over time, and with different resources and technical assistance that we can offer you, um, you'll get there. So I think you guys made some great points, uh, as well as the point about staff role modeling too. That's so important, and I think that's something um, that we heard throughout all of our site visits over the last couple of years. Um, and you know that, that it's true, that the kids look up to the after school program staff, that the kids look up to your summer camp counselors. Um, they really are their role models for these programs, so it's so important that they're exhibiting these healthy habits um, so the kids will model it after them. So that's great. I think we've got um, a couple of questions that have come in, but they're kind of focused back on that meals piece. So actually we're gonna move on here. Um, and I'd love to know what your biggest success has been with implementing these healthy eating physical activity um, standards. So if there's something that kind of sticks out, I mean, you talked about um, being able to save some money and you talked about some of those changes that you've seen, but what has been your kind of biggest big picture success? Well, I, I, th that's really hard to say because the financial part was huge. <laughs> uh, I, I really have to say that I think that the culture change in our organization has been overall the biggest success that we've experienced. And just seeing that shift and people talking about it and hearing. Um, and, and just to kind of touch on that strategy point a little bit, it's repeat, repeat, repeat. We, we just keep talking about it, and I personally talk about it everywhere I go. Uh, we put it in, we put the standards in uh, staff manuals. We ask, uh, the, we ask about the standards on interview questions. Uh, everywhere we can implement it. We have program calendars that are, um, you know, general blank templates that we hand out. A lot of recreation departments do that. Well, we would fill some of those in in advance. So we would fill in or make little footnotes at the bo bottom of the calendar saying that you're going to make sure that you go outside for 60 minutes in a day and that in, in the lunch hour it says staff sit and eat with kids and there might be a little note about um, not making sure that it's healthy and appropriate and um, and we're doing those things so overall I really think it's the culture shift because I know so many agencies they'll say oh wow to make a culture shift it takes a long time and it really has been over the last a year and a half that we've seen this uh, happen and um, I'm really probably most proud about that. That's great. And again, about the financial savings. Yeah, as well. <laughs> that's definitely a, a benefit. What about you, Rian? Yeah, I was just again um, trying to implement, I mean, not there yet, but we're trying to implement again as a can't stress enough is to organize your after school program. Uh, our goal is to. Um, you know, provide a nutritious program, but also making them active, active. So what we do have in our after school program is a curriculum. Uh, we're going to do a nutritious cur curriculum and allow staff to be creative as possible. Um, we are going to give them 20 minutes of some form of physical activity 
and the staff get to choose uh, um, how creative they can become, if it's going to be a nature hawk, if it's going to be an indoor hawk, and we're also going to provide a, as I like to call, an enrichment section where it's basically arts and crafts or stuff like that. So we're trying, so we're implementing that this fall uh, for our summer uh, program that just uh, went by. It was that transition of uh, very little sitting, but more moving. Uh, a lot of games, a lot of activities, a lot of field trips whereby they are going swimming and, uh, and when they go to the pool, just not uh, sitting around in the water, but having games out there to make them more active. Um, so I think that's one of our one of our biggest goals. We're not there, but we are moving in that direction. That's great. Um, so we've talked about successes. Mm -hmm. What have been your biggest challenges with this work? Well, I talk about the culture change, but I think the the biggest challenge is really the staff mm -hmm. buy-in uh, initially. Uh, once we could, you know, get a few people on board or a particular unit within your recreation department, mm -hmm. and other folks see you be successful, then they want to be successful too. So it kind of snowballs. But again, it's that y you know, it's getting past the way we've always done yeah. things, and change is hard for folks. And, and so I think that, you know, the education component's probably been internally our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our biggest challenge is, is, is um, we have a mature staff, um, with mature staff working there for 20, 30 years. Um, uh, um, they set in their ways, so, so in order to get staff buying is very, very crucial and that's been our hardest challenge right now. There are our other challenges, basically our facilities, especially during winter. Um, some of my housing communities have literally a room of uh, uh, 20 by 20 space. Uh, so they cannot go outside, but as I said again, you know, encouraging the staff uh, of trying to be creative. We don't have to do jumping jacks. We can do, you know, take the Wii out, um, uh, do the bowling. Uh, I'm, I'm playing the tennis game on the Wii and stuff, at least they are moving, so trying to work through that. Um, so that was, uh, um, is, and still is, our biggest challenge is, is uh, the buying of staff, especially during the summer. Um, you know, during our summer we have a, a, a 20 to 30 minute of quiet time. Um, and that's where the staff and kids just relax and try to calm them down uh, after a busy morning. Um, and I would like to see that, um, you know, not happen because we need to keep kids active all the time in our program. So, so we're trying to move. Hopefully by next year we'll be able to eliminate or reduce that time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, okay, let's do one more question mm -hmm. on HEPA and then we'll move one last time mm -hmm. to nutrition literacy and I just want to remind you guys tuning in um, to submit your questions. We do see a lot of them still coming in uh, that are more specific for the meals programs. So if you have questions about that, please feel free to email me um, and we can get you the best resources for that and I'm happy to answer them at that time. But if you have questions right now about those healthy eating physical activity standards, you can ask them. You'll also be able to ask a lot of questions in the next session that's really focused on that. Um, but last question about HEPA, have you guys noticed uh, any changes in your community? So not just specific to Parks and Rec, but any community-wide changes um, because of the implementation of these standards, whether you've been working with new partners um, or you have any large-scale community events where you've noticed changes or just kind of overall, um, how does it tie into that, that culture of health change? Well, I think we've been able to start to connect or do a little bit of program linking, which has been key. So we had a big uh, county-wide Move More Montgomery initiative, and that goes beyond our, our recreation department. It's multiple county agencies coming together to, um, to push this initiative. But I think through our recreation department, we've been able to do a lot of, uh, of outreach and, and reach not only young people, but um, get seniors more active and really just get the, the community up in um, community at large up and moving and it's been a really key and and that's where sort of those large-scale events come into play and to make sure that whenever we are a part of one of those large-scale events or we have are hosting our own event that there is a healthy eating physical activity component within that event and that's something that's really been um, instrumental in making that 
overarching community change. But a lot of it, it's sort of that grassroots movement. It's the kids. Mm -hmm. And the kids are learning about, um, you know, food preparation and uh, healthy eating. And they're learning about how to make things with certain ingredients. And they're going home and they're creating shopping lists with, for their parents. I can't tell you how many parents come back to me and they say, oh, my kid made me go to the store and, and we had to buy these things. And wow, they cooked dinner or they prepared a food at home. So it's almost that grassroots movement with the, starting with the young people and then um, and moving up through their parents. Mm -hmm. okay. So in Charlottesville, um, our community is very, very forward thinking. Um, we kind of on the flip side of the community. The community is so healthy, um, very bike friendly, uh, very walkable community. And, and, and our department is trying to get there. So we get a lot of requests from parents coming to us. Hey, why are you serving bad food at a special event? So now in a whole park and recreation department, we do not serve any sodas. We only serve water. Um, um, we have healthy options um, in terms of any community event now. So we are changing that. That's a great thing. Um, unfortunately, we try to change Halloween with candy. Uh, um, and that never went well because the community said, you saw, you are getting all healthy, but at least just give us a break for one day for Halloween. So now we focus on not chocolate candy, but just hard candy in our Halloween. Uh, but coming back to our after school sites, uh, um, parents are becoming aware of those healthy choices and they commend us for doing that. Yes, we still get the parents that still know where's the soda, where's the junk food. Unfortunately, we are sticking um, to our uh, department's strategic plan is to try to get healthy options out there because we, we need to follow the motto of we have to practice what we preach. Uh, I mean, that's where, we, where we're moving towards. That's great, awesome, thank you guys. So um, the last little topic, mini topic, we're gonna talk about here um, is your experience implementing a nutrition literacy program in your uh, before and after school program. So again, later this afternoon, we're gonna have a session that's dedicated on that Foods of the Month curriculum. Um, but we would love to hear about your experience uh, implementing any type of nutrition literacy in your before and after school programs. So it happens in, in kind of two different formats for us. In the summertime, when we got the NRPA grant, that's when we first really started getting into it. And we used the Oregon Wise Guys curriculum, which was successful. Uh, we went through the curriculum. We found components that worked well for us. But I know that there's so many recreation departments out there that have the same challenge. It was. We're trying to meet staff ratios in the summer. We're doing our best to get uh, our, and we rely so heavily on seasonal uh, staff, and we're trying to get them to do some of the basics. And we're trying to get them to make sure they're you know, supervising the kids, they're following youth camp standards, and they're doing all of those things. To know to drop on top of that a, a particular curriculum and have them deliver it was gonna be a little bit of a challenge. So when I was first getting started, I went found one of my key vendors. The, and it was the vendor that I could go to and say, hey, I don't have a whole lot of money, but I need you to help me out here. And that I could pay to deliver the curriculum for us. So I gave them the equipment that we got from the grant. We went through it together and we sat down and we came up with a plan. And that vendor, we, we provided a schedule, went around to all of our programs providing the Oregon Wise Guys curriculum. Since then, we've grown. Because we've had success, our department's been able to do a little bit of realignment and create a health and wellness program manager. Now that individual is a career staff person who now is uh, hiring a small group of seasonal staff during the uh, summer months to go around and implement curriculums at um, in implement healthy education programs throughout all of our summer programs. So this year I believe they hit 26 locations and provided about six hours of nutrition education uh, for each site. So that was huge for us uh, and we hope to keep that momentum going. Now after school is a little bit different. We rely and I, uh, I should have mentioned them earlier because they've been a big part of our partnerships, but our nonprofit community. We reach out to so many of our nonprofit providers who can provide cooking education, nutrition education. They're combining that with uh, physical activity and fitness. And we are um, paying them reasonable amounts to go do service delivery for us within our programs. Great. 
Yeah, so uh, with our, and I'll split it up again with our summer and our after school. In our summer program, uh, we heavily utilize our, uh, we call them assistant director. Um, so uh, we have uh, seven camps and our assistant director, they will be in charge of curriculum. And with the curriculum that uh, we have right now is so much easy, user-friendly, that you can just go to the website, um, see what the fruit of the month is, uh, um, and utilize uh, those materials to implement with kids. And compared to last year with Organ Wise Guy, it was great, uh, but uh, certain uh, groups um, uh, uh, had challenges. For instance, our little, little ones, um, they enjoyed the puppet, uh, where our teens, um, we had to change that up and make it more appropriate. So that's when we done with our teen, uh, was mostly hands-on um, with fruit and vegetables. So if it's not, it's a cooking experiment or, 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 or it's a vegetable building uh, vegetables together so they can touch, feel, and then at the end of they eat. Uh, but with this new curriculum out there, uh, staff really liked it. Um, it uh, we normally have in the summer a whole week of training and one of the segments is just focus on curriculum. And we provide, uh, this summer, we provide uh, two hours um, for the week uh, of curriculum through our nine week program. Our after school program, um, we are implementing it this year. And that's exactly one of my challenges is we have limited staff in, in Charlottesville. We only have one staff. So uh, um, I'm trying to figure out how to get a vendor to come in and to provide that service for us. Great, yeah, and you know, we hear a lot about um, different strategies in implementing nutrition liter li literacy. So, um, you know, sometimes you're able to rely on your program staff to be able to teach that directly to the kids, but it is so beneficial when you can have someone from the community coming in, um, whether it's a nonprofit partner or someone from 4-H um, or Health and Human Services or someone with that nutrition background. We talk a lot about interns. Is there a local university that offers programs in nutrition um, or even fitness that you can bring them in um, and use their skills uh, and it's kind of a benefit for them as well because a lot of times they need that kind of real world experience or perhaps even an internship mm -hmm. um, and you're able to save some costs there but have someone who's interested in that work and uh, it's always nice too when you have someone new coming into your programs the kids get excited about it uh, but I think the key is that it looks different in each community it looks different in each setting uh, and really taking whatever curriculum it is if it's the foods of the month or if you're using other curriculums as well and figuring out the best way to implement into your in implement that into your programming. So uh, a couple more questions and then we're going to get ready for our first break here. Uh, just a quick one while we transition, but um, how do you guys engage your parents in the nutrition literacy program uh, as well as those HEPA standards? How do you communicate with them? Um, what's been successful? What's been challenging? We know that that's always that parent engagement aspect is always um, somewhat challenging for park and recreation agencies and, and all out of school time providers for that matter. It is um, parent engaging uh, engagement and parent organizing is where we need to ramp up our efforts. There's no doubt. Uh, we are sending home newsletters. So one of the things is trying to make sure that our staff are um, are implementing a standard within the new within the content of the newsletter uh, that's an easy way to do it um, um, sending home work products the kids develop something or they develop the educational piece or an art piece around healthy eating and physical activity and they take that home but we're not where we need to be when it comes to engaging parents particularly the uh, parents of teenagers um, when you don't see them they just kind of I think throw the kid out the door when they <laughs> drop them off. They don't even stop the car sometimes, and and uh, or the kid walks home on their own, and so we don't see the parents of the teenagers a lot. So it's doing some outreach, I, and I go back to the principals who've been a um, very important piece of this. It's getting the word out through the schools as well has been helpful. One strategy that we have used to get at least in front of parents, and I think now that we need to develop our message a little bit stronger, is asking to be part of back to school nights. I'm fortunate, I have a lot of bilingual staff. Schools need help there. 
So we've offered to help at back to school nights or orientations because we want to get in front of the parents and kids as well to market our programs and take advantage. So when they have orientations for rising sixth graders going into middle schools and we have a lot of middle school programs, we want to be there. So we're offering up um, opportunities. PTAs, I'll tell you a little trick is um, schools want engagement in their PTAs from their parents and families. And a lot of communities, parents don't come because they don't have child care services. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get out, provide recreational, physical activity opportunities at PTA meetings, like taking place in the gym while they're over meeting in the media center. We could send a staff person to get in front of parents and sort of get that time to engage the families while the kids are being physically active. And then it's, it's about reinforcing at that point at that point really telling the parents hey do you realize what we did we've had your young people active for 60 minutes um, this has been great then they start thinking about it and they might be more likely to come back to the next PTSA meeting schools are happy we're happy we've been able to deliver our message we've been able to maybe increase our enrollment so that's been one little mm -hmm. uh, sneak tactic yeah, that we've been crazy. used don't don't let my si my secret out to the school system <laughs> Yeah, right, I mean, Maria. again, that's our biggest challenge is uh, parent engagement um, in Charlottesville. Um, you know, in our summer camp, uh, we send out newsletters. Um, um, we communicate uh, uh, quite effectively because we have a captive audience because mom has to pick them up, mom has to drop them off, or dad, vice versa, or the guardian. So that's our opportunity to engage. Where our biggest um, struggle is, is our after-school program. It's a drop-in program. So one of our rules is um, you don't have to come with a parent to our after-school program. You just need to be eight years old. And if you're under eight, it has to be with a parent or guardian. Um, so we are trying to look at other forms of strategies of how to engage with the parent. Um, so that's one of our goals for this year is to look at how do we capture that audience. And uh, even with our open houses, last year I had an open house for after school. Um, we even brought food and we thought food will be the answer to get the parents. And we still had less than 10% of parents show up and all the kids showed up. Um, so uh, we are trying to, uh, one of the staff's recommendation was again, you know, uh, in the community, um, you know, um, and I know it's an old school method, but it works, you know, door to door. Um, uh, dropping off flyers because we use the school system to put flyers in every Friday uh, 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 um, backpack. Uh, but you know what that looks like if you're a parent on Friday, you see 15 pieces of flyers and it goes to the trash. So we want to try to stay away from that, whereby actually going to door to door in the community um, to kind of engaging them on like uh, open houses and to get parents engaged. That's great. Yeah, I think those are some really good strategies. Mm -hmm. We know that um, it's always a challenge to engage parents and with their busy schedules, um, but definitely taking advantage of some of those things that already exist, whether mm -hmm. it's the Foods of the Month newsletter or those resources for the home, um, holding special events and open houses, working with your school system and your PTA, um, you know, and Again, there's the old school technique of going right. door to door until you get an answer. So right. um, we are going to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Adrian and Rianne, for mm -hmm. joining us. Um, I know that okay. there were some questions that went unanswered, so we'll make sure to follow up with you guys. But we're going to take a quick five minute break and we will be back with Jill and Ava from the Alliance talking about the HEPA standards.